Yo yo! Welcome to another biology podcast, guys. Another day and yet another greeting. I seem to be sitting on this computer a lot this week. Well, that's okay. We're getting through this genetics unit quite well now, so uh, let's keep the momentum going and uh, keep learning the stuff we need to learn. So, as the title suggests, we're going to be learning about how genes are controlled. Um, but before we even start talking about that, let's look at the big picture and where we're at in terms of this unit of learning so far. So just think for yourself a second, maybe pause it. What's the actual purpose of this whole unit of work? What's the big thing we're trying to learn? So the answer to that question is that we're trying to learn how DNA actually determines the traits that we have. So how actual the DNA molecule decides what color eyes we have, or the DNA molecule, how it decides all the different traits or characteristics an organism can have. So in order to learn about that, we've already learned quite a lot of stuff already. So let's just have a quick recap of that. First of all, we know that all cells have DNA in them. And that's pretty much all cells have a full copy of the whole genome for any particular organism. So, for example, in a human being, pretty much all the cells have a full copy of the DNA. And by now, we should also know that all cells need all that DNA so that they can make the proteins that allow them to carry out the life processes. That's all of Mrs. Gren, so that they can move, so they can respire, grow, and all those sorts of things. So we know these proteins are important, and we've also learned how these proteins are actually made from the DNA. That was the last thing we did, transcription, RNA processing, translation, all that stuff. But there are still a few gaps in our knowledge that are really important. We've got a few questions to ask. So we know how DNA is used to make proteins, but does that really mean that cells just continuously express all the genes that they have? Well, the answer to that is no. And there's a few reasons for that answer. First of all, for most cells, it would be a complete waste of time to just continuously um, synthesize proteins or make proteins from all their different genes at the same time. I mean, some genes are constantly being expressed. For example, so the genes that code for the proteins that make up the enzymes that carry out respiration, because those proteins are always required, those genes are continuously being expre expressed. However, other proteins in the cell aren't needed all the time. And because of that, the expression of those genes is turned on and off, depending on the actual situation at a particular time. So over this podcast and the next podcast, what we're going to actually look at is how, how genes are controlled, how the expression of genes is controlled in both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. How are those genes turned on and off? So if a gene is turned on, it's actually being transcribed and then translated, so proteins are being made from it. And if a gene is turned off, well, that's just not happening. So let's get down to business, and let's look at how genes are controlled in prokaryotic cells. Quick reminder, though. First of all, what is a prokaryotic cell? Well, we should know by now, so just have a quick think about it, and then I'll go through the answers in a second. So a prokaryotic cell is a cell that doesn't have a proper nucleus. That means its genetic information, the DNA, isn't actually kept within a nuclear membrane or a nuclear envelope. What is the difference between the DNA or the genes in a prokaryotic cell and a eukaryotic cell? Can you remember that? Well, the answer was in the last podcast. Eukaryotic cells actually have introns and exons. Exons being the parts of the gene that actually are involved in making proteins, and the introns are being those interruptions. Prokaryotic cells don't have introns. All the gene is all transcribed into proteins. So hopefully by now you've got that difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells clearly in your mind. So now let's look at how a particular prokaryotic cell and how it actually controls the way that it expresses its genes, and also why it even bothers to control the way that it expresses certain genes. So the cell I want to talk about is an E. coli cell. That's a type of bacteria, and that's a prokaryotic cell. Now, prokaryotic cells like E. coli have sets of genes that they call operons. Now, operons are something that's unique to prokaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells do not have operons. And an operon basically is a set of genes that are located next to each other on the bacterial chromosome. And this whole set of genes can be turned on or off depending on the conditions that the cells are experiencing at any given time. If that set of genes is turned on, then those genes are transcribed into mRNA and then made into polypeptide chains. And if they're turned off, then that's not happening. So the lac operon is a set of genes that the E. coli cell has 
that are actually involved in the breakdown of lactose. And lactose is a sugar that's present in milk. So the lac operon is a set of genes that basically code for proteins that are used to break down lactose into sugars that the cell can then use. I guess in a way that would be like, for example, you're in your mouth you have spit, and in the spit is the enzyme amylase. So you have cells that create that, that, sorry, you have genes that actually code for amylase, they're protein amylase, that then digest starch that you eat into sugars that then your body can use. So the lac operon does a similar thing for the E. coli. It's a set of genes that break down lactose into sugars that the E. coli cell can then use. So as the video is showing, you've got different important parts of the lac operon. You've got bacterial DNA. You've got a repressor molecule, which is on your screen now. A, a transcript of mRNA. A lactose molecule. And then you've got two particular proteins that are actually made by the genes there, which are called permease and beta-galactosidase. Now, if you go inside the E. coli cell, as you can see on the screen now, you can see the bacterial DNA. And the coloured sections at the top, which are coloured in sort of red, orange, green, yellow, is the lac operon. That's a section of the bacterial DNA. So on your screen there, you can see an area of the DNA or the area of the genes there that is called the controlling region. Now as part of the controlling region there's actually one of the genes there that's actually called the promoter gene or sometimes just called the promoter. And in the video that's the red bit. You've also got another gene there which is a sort of bit next to the red bit, this sort of pinky peachy coloured bit which is called the operator. And then the orange bit to the right of that is the start of what we call the structural genes and they're the genes that actually make the enzymes that are going to be used to break down the lactose sugar. Now you'll notice at the minute that that molecule that's sitting on top of the controlling region that's called the repressor molecule that's actually sitting there and that's going to actually stop transcription from actually taking place which is obviously the first part of protein synthesis. And the reason that stops transcription taking place is because it's actually preventing RNA polymerase from binding to the DNA and actually creating an mRNA transcript. The reason that repressor molecule is actually there is because at this particular point in time, there is no lactose around, so the genes don't need to be transcribed. So let's have a look at what happens when there is some lactose around. Now in the lac operon, lactose works as what we call an inducer molecule which means it induces protein synthesis and it actually turns the genes on. And you see there in the video that the lactose is actually binding into the repressor molecule, which causes the repressor molecule to lift away from the operator, which then allows RNA polymerase to bind to the promoter region, the promoter gene, and begin transcription. As you can see there, it's moving along the DNA and it's transcribing those structural genes and forming an mRNA transcript. Now, as you can see, the mRNA transcript is now moving on to a ribosome, and the ribosome is then reading through it, and with the aid of all the tRNA that we've talked around, it's actually creating the two proteins. So permease actually goes to the cell membrane and actually acts as a pore, which basically gets as much of the lactose into the cell as possible. So it actually basically promotes the amount of lactose that the cell can get into itself, which is important because it needs the lactose as a form of sugar, which it can use as energy. And while permease is doing that, beta-galactosidase, which is an enzyme, basically is then changing the lactose into glucose and galactose, which are two simple sugars that the cell can then use for cell processes, respiration, and so on. Basically, use those sugars as a form of energy. So just to recap, as the lactose concentration increases in the cell, the lactose binds to the repressor, moves it away from the operator. RNA polymerase can then transcribe the gene. The proteins are made. They do their different jobs, and so on and so forth. So what happens when the lactose levels drop again? Well, as you can see in the video there, those lactose molecules that are actually attached to the repressor actually disassociate with them, so they basically leave the repressor alone. And at this point, the repressor then moves back down to the controlling region, binds back onto the operator, and prevents any further transcription from taking place. So the process you've just seen there makes sure that those enzymes are only created, those proteins are only created when lactose is there and when it needs to. And that prevents waste and wasted energy, wasted resources, and all the rest of it. So that's gene control in prokaryotes. Keep it real. I'll speak to you soon.